Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us <coughs> today for this uh, Experiments World Tour More Science from the Road webinar. This is a, a webinar co-organized by the European Schoolnet in partnership with the Scientix Project. My name is Chanel Martinez and I'm a Communications Officer at the European Schoolnet. Uh, today with me, there's also my colleague Celia, who is uh, in charge of technical uh, support. So if you have any issue, you can uh, address it to her. So just so you know, uh, you will be <coughs> muted and your cameras also are disabled. So if you have any um, issue or questions, you can uh, write them in the chat. And during the webinar, you will see that my colleagues uh, will be posting messages uh, on the chat uh, regarding the signature list, which is very important to fill this form because it will allow you to receive a certificate of participation. So be sure to sign it. It will be posted different times during the webinar, so don't worry if you miss it the first time, but please uh, be sure to sign it. Um, so yeah, today we have uh, our guest, uh, the Scientix Ambassador Michael Gregory, who is performing his new science show experiments uh, world tour in three languages in 12 countries on different uh, continents. So welcome, Michael, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, it's always great to, uh, to have a webinar with you guys. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here again. And can we go to the next slide for this part? So a lot of my webinars, I start by introducing who I, oh, that's your slides, not mine. Okay, there we go. So uh, like they said, I'm a Scientix ambassador uh, from Paris, France. And often uh, I explain where you might've seen me before, different webinars, things like that. But I decided it'd be fun, this one, to ask everyone who knows me already or has seen me other places, write in the chat where the last place you've seen me was, whether it was my last Scientix webinar in June, previous one, Scientix conference, anything in person. I've visited a lot of countries, a lot of teachers. Um, so if I saw you in person, then write where and when I saw you approximately. Um, and if you've never seen me before, feel free to write never or just not write in the chat. And for some reason, I'm not having visibility for the chat. I don't know if it's with a permission or whatnot. So if there's any interesting answers, can someone from the Scientix team relay some of those to me? Sure, Michael, we have Yasmina who says uh, uh, she met you at the experiment, experiment share a few days ago online. Ah, excellent. I think that's Yasmina from uh, Tuz, Tuzla in Bosnia. Uh, or it could be Yasmina from Serbia, either one, great to see you here. Tuzla, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, or uh, uh, another, Elisa uh, Elzbieta during a webinar, and uh, somebody um, called Tania from Serbia in September. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, that might be Tania Goic who uh, helped me organize the conference there as exactly. well. Exactly. Perfect. So it's, it was well, great to see you here, Tanya. It's good to see a lot of familiar people. Um, and for those of who you, those of you who don't know me yet, I'll briefly explain uh, who I am. So can we go to the next slide? So here's a number of the more recent things I've done with Scientix, uh, including the latest two episodes of Scientix TV. If you haven't checked those out, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, of course, the conference in November and a number of past web webinars. Can we go to uh, the next slide again? Uh, again. And in addition to being uh, a Scientix ambassador, I'm also the Science on Stage ambassador for France. I wouldn't be surprised if a number of people uh, who I've met through that excellent network are, are here as well. If any of you aren't yet aware of Science on Stage, I strongly encourage you to get involved, especially with your uh, national, national uh, chapter. Um, and there will be national festivals throughout member countries this year. Yasmina already mentioned, she knows me from my monthly experiment shares. I'll mention this again at the end of the, the webinar and invite everyone to come to next week uh, on Wednesday will be the February experiment share. 
Uh, and a number of places where I traveled by bike, like where I am in Morocco uh, now, uh, or different workshops I've done, like the Science on Stage uh, workshop. That was the one I mentioned Tanya helped me organize uh, in in Serbia, in Pojega, with another friend, Gordana, who, I don't know if Gordana is here or not. If so, please say, say hi in the chat so we know you're here too. Oh, perfect. That's a thumbs up. So hi, Gordana. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit about different places where um, I've been recently, both online and in person. But the main goal of this webinar is to talk about where I am right now and what I'm doing right now. So can, can we go on to the next slide for that? So uh, I'm performing a science show, which I came up with last June. It, and I, my June webinar, I went into a number of details about it. So I'm like, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail other than to say that it was uh, a long term goal to get more into science performance. Things kind of fell in place at the same time that things kind of fell apart at my school where I'd been working for the past 14 years. So I took that as a sign to take time. It, I'm kind of like on a gap year or sabbatical year without a job to return to, uh, but hoping to transition to a, a PhD uh, next year in science education and making science more accessible through low cost experiments. Um, and I already have like an advisor lined up, a good university, things like that. So uh, hopefully everything works out for now, for, for that. But for now, uh, I'm trying to go to as many places as possible. And one of the main things I'm doing is showing my new science show. So as mentioned before, so far I've done it in three different languages. Those are the three that I speak best. I, I could do it in Italian if I sort out like anyone who wants, if, if anyone wants to invite me to Italy to do it, um, don't expect perfect Italian, but I'll, I'll manage to get by with that. Uh, in four continents, which I, I'm impressed, things kind of worked out being invited to Kazakhstan in September to perform at a festival there. And then to Mexico uh, by Scientix Ambassador Diana, Diana Rubio. Rubia, Rubio. Uh, if Diana's here, say hi as well in the chat. Um, but other than that, most of the places I got to, like over the course of the summer and the fall, biking around Europe. So it was really Europe based with a couple other places. And now I'm taking the time to bike into Africa. It's been a lifetime goal to see the transition of people moving from North Africa across the Sahara into the, the other side of Africa uh, and stopping at a number of schools along the way. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So this current trip, I'm trying to go from Morocco to Senegal. That, that's far a far cry from trying to go through all of Africa or uh, even a good proportion of it, but it, it's a much bigger continent than Europe. Um, so you'll see with only approximately three countries and approximately 4,000 kilometers, um, whereas with a similar distance in Europe, and like I, I know because I've done it, you can fairly easily go to like 10 different countries. Um, also with languages that I tend to master a lot better. Um, so a lot of you probably know that in a lot of Morocco, French is widely spoken because it was a French pr protectorate for a long time. So there's a lot of people who speak French, but when I end up in village schools in the middle of nowhere, there's a lot of people who don't. Uh, <laughs> there's also a lot of parts of the country where Spanish is widely spoken. But again, once you get into more isolated er uh, areas, it, it's a little bit harder to, to get by uh, with translation. So I, I'm, I'm working on a couple of less verbally uh, involved experiments. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, and so one thing to mention is um, I need to keep the bike working throughout the trip. Uh, oh, oh I, I guess I didn't think to mention at the beginning of this webinar, but uh, in some of the slides or with some of the things I'm saying, I'll try and address some of the more common questions that I'm asked, like what happens if you break down? How many times have you got a flat tire? Things like that. And so luckily on this trip so far, I haven't had any major um, like maintenance issues. Uh, one of the things though, before going on this trip, I replaced most of the moving parts on the bike, like the wheels, the tires, the uh, chain, the rear cassette, not not the front uh, chain rings. Those are still in good enough condition, only a couple thousand kilometers on them. 
And uh, for pretty much all my repairs, I do them myself. During the pandemic, when it was more difficult to travel, uh, then I took the opportunity to take some time, in addition to my teaching, to work as a part-time bike repairman. And so repairing other people's bikes, I gained confidence and speed, identifying and fixing any problems with my bike. Um, so hopefully the skills I learned there will, uh, well, hopefully I won't need to use them. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. But if something goes wrong, like across the Sahara, it gets reasonably isolated in some stretches. I'll be reasonably far from a bike shop at sometimes. So I've got more spare parts than I typically carry in Europe. And hopefully nothing insurmountable ends up uh, breaking. Um, can we go to the next slide? And a lot of people ask why I'm not in school this year. I mean, I, I kind of mentioned that earlier when I said it was a lifetime goal to come up with a science performance and things didn't work out so well with my school. But one of the other questions that comes up all the time is how do I pay for a trip like this? And there's a couple things uh, that help with that. One is trying to cut costs as much as possible whenever possible. But another is working remotely when I can. So uh, these three pictures here, uh, the one on the left uh, shows me in a forest, it's actually kind of covered in garbage. Uh, and I'm teaching a course for teacher trainers in Kazakhstan. Uh, and so being able to make some money while on the road for that. But that adds a heck of a lot of constraints needing to find somewhere with a good internet connection usually indoors uh but what happened that day i was kind of delayed um uh i was hungry and there was a, a souk which is like a, a market in this part of the world and it seemed like a good place to stop for a quick bite to eat but things just took forever and so i didn't make it to a town where i could do the course from a cafe but i had a strong enough um uh mobile signal um from practice in other places i've traveled uh, including mexico and ghana I'll tend to get a SIM card from the two biggest mobile providers with plenty of data. Uh, even right now, I'm in a, a cheap hotel in the mountains, and the Wi-Fi here is awful. So just before this session, it was it was good enough. It worked for my Kazakhstan course that I did a couple hours ago. Um, but for some reason, it just wasn't working out when I went to connect uh, now. So I've got my phone hanging outside, so it's got a, a better signal, and it's as good a signal as I have in Paris, I, I think. Um, so that's the story behind that. Let's go to the next slide. So as I make my way across Morocco and, and into Africa, things are a bit different than back in Europe. And I, I kind of forgot how fortunate I am to have teacher networks like Scientix and also science on stage, which I've mentioned before. And so once I've gotten involved with these two networks, then anytime I'm going somewhere new, I could very easily look up all the scientific ambassadors for that country, send out an email, say, hey, I'm planning on being in your country. Does anyone want to invite me to your school? Does anyone want to try and organize a workshop together? Uh, does anyone want me to perform my science show? And Scientists and ambassadors being great ambassadors for STEM in their countries are usually very helpful and very enthusiastic, uh, pointing me in the right direction, often organizing things themselves. But if they're not in the right part of the country, they often know people uh, somewhere useful for me. Um, these networks don't yet have any presence in Morocco. Uh, I was excited during this trip. I saw the call for new ambassadors. And so I'm eager to share that with a number of the great teachers I've been meeting in Morocco. And hopefully, after this next call for scientists ambassadors, we'll get a couple of uh, ambassadors from this part of the world as well. Um, but also mentioning diverse settings for where I've been doing experiments. So uh, if you look on Google Maps, for example, or if you try and do any kind of internet research, if you look for different places in Morocco, and it's not specific to Morocco, there's a lot of a lot of countries, especially outside of Europe, the information isn't as complete as you might believe it to be. So I can find places where there are schools, but without a significant amount of additional work, I can't find contact phone numbers, contact emails, or anything like that. And so if I want to show up somewhere random or, or like go to small towns where they might not 
commonly see someone from another country sharing experiments, then a lot of that needs to be organized the same day or like the night before as I get into town, just because there's no easy way that I've found so far. If anyone has experience in this part of the world and is happy to share, please, please let me know. Um, and so a lot of the schools I've been in, like the photo on the left and the one on the right, those are from private schools that were organized by contacts who I've met in Europe or through European things. The one on the left was a, a friend named Badier who I met at uh, the Science Me Festival in Geneva last July. And the one on the right was the uh, French International School of Casablanca that, oddly enough, is part of the English Language Schools Association of France. Um, so it's connected with that way. Uh, but my, fa my favorite picture of these is the one in the middle that shows kids outside of a school. So I was in a small town and stopped by the police station the night before to ask, are there any places where I can camp? Or are there any guest houses or anything like that in this town? They said, well, well, wait a couple minutes. And then uh, they called a lady in and they said, uh, she's a friendly lady. She'll uh, let you stay at her house. Uh, and so I met her and met uh, her daughter, who was a teacher. And, I, of course, I told them about my science show. And I said, would you like me to do a show for the kids at the school across the street? And they said, yeah, yeah, that would be wonderful. So we planned to do it at 9 the next morning before I leave because I was in a bit of a rush uh, to get to the next towns I needed to go. Um, and so we're at the school at nine and the school is supposed to open at nine and there's kids hanging about, but there's no teachers to be seen. No, no teachers or administrators, no one with a key to the school. And this goes on to like maybe nine twenty or so. No one's around. So I, I say to, to Seda, who was the woman who hosted me, do we just want to do it in front of the school for the kids? <laughs> and so I start pulling things out of my bag and doing experiments. Um, but both not speaking any Arabic uh, and then Seda needing to translate from French, but her French was a bit rusty and hard to shout to a bunch of kids on the street. It made me realize I really need to start incorporating more experiments that can be understood with absolutely no, um, no like verbal component. Because at times, unlike anywhere I've been in Europe, there will be no one, well, there will be no one around to translate. It will be more difficult to translate. Uh, like, for example, when I was in Tuzla, there was a student from one of the schools who spoke English very well, who followed me around to like four or five schools in the same day when I was doing experiments. Uh, that's happened tons of times in a number of countries as well. Um, students or English teachers or like, there's always someone who speaks usually English, but if not French, um, I mean, in Mexico, everyone spoke Spanish. Um, but here, there really are zones where I'm struggling with that. Um, so if, if anyone has any ideas, uh, including for like experiments I should try and include for that, please let me know. Or better yet, come to my experiment share a week from right now uh, and share it with everyone who joins that. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? Because it's almost time for some experiments. Well, I, actually, it's exactly time for some experiments. So the first one, this is going to be a little bit difficult to explain on camera, but it's one that I like a lot, so I want to try anyways. And it, like, if it doesn't show up well, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to explain what's going on on the slide, and then we're going to turn the slides off so I hold things bigger and you can see them bigger. So what I'm doing here is from uh, left to right, I'm putting a piece of paper underneath my bicycle tire. I did it front, then back, so I did it for both and tracing an outline of the contact patch of the tire with the ground. And if you've ridden a bike before, or if you've watched a heavily loaded car, you'll be familiar with the idea that the more you load it down, the more the tire gets squished and the bigger the contact area is. And this very closely follows a pressure law where the, the pressure will be equal to the force times the area. And so with a couple of simple calculations, I should be able to uh, estimate or estimate, calculate, experimentally measure the weight of my bike unloaded, which is the leftmost picture, loaded with my bags, but not me, which is the middle picture, and with me kind of holding onto the side. Now, this is a very approximate way of doing things. And an enormous source of error is the thickness of the rubber in the tire. 
which means it's not just air that's making the contact. Um, so don't expect the results to be perfect. Um, but can we stop sharing the slides and I'll show you the results that I have? And my results. OK, so now you should be able to see me big. And I realized my results, rather than being where I was looking for them, I left them right in front of me in the first place. So I was too well organized uh, for once. So like I said, don't expect this to appear perfectly on camera. But this is the outline of my front tire with the blue pen being when the bike was unloaded, the red being when it was loaded, and the yellow when it was being loaded with my weight on it as well. And it doesn't appear that clear. There's some parts where I've made a mark where the top and bottom of the contact was because it's difficult to uh, go around it with a pen. The back tire, you can see it's bigger, which makes sense. There's more weight on the back tire, but the uh, bottom one wasn't lined up so well. And so for a simplified version of that, I took measurements, like just using a ruler and copying it, so approximating the tire as a rectangle and looking and saying, OK, for the front tire, the unloaded 40 centimeters squared, uh, the middle one 52 centimeters squared. And when it had my weight, because some of my weight goes to the handlebars, most goes to the back, the area was 85.5 centimeters squared. Now, those of you who teach physics or probably who teach chemistry as well, we'll know a little bit about uh, units for pressure. And uh, one bar is approximately equal to uh, 100 kilopascals. And a pascal, and you can check this later, like it, I'm going fast with it. I don't expect anyone to be like, oh, okay, the, these units, like unless you know the units. But uh, a pascal is equal to a newton per centimeter squared. Uh, and so, it works out that one bar of pressure equals 10 newtons per centimeter squared. And on Earth, the force of gravity, the acceleration due to gravity, is about 10 meters per second squared. So it works out really handy. The area in centimeters squared should give approximately the number of kilograms that was causing uh, that deformation of the tire. Now, we see from the first one, it's small enough, like the weight of the front part of the bike wouldn't be 40 kilos. That would be ridiculous. Uh, that would be a very heavy bike. But I said one of the sources of error is the thickness of the rubber. So if we just look at the difference between the two. So 42 kilos and 52 kilos for when the front bikes are on, the difference between those is 12 kilos. So we know that my front bike bags weigh about, well, have a mass of about 12 kilos. And if we go all the way to 85.5, so that's when I'm riding on it, that means of my weight, then uh, 85.5 minus 52, that's about 33 and a half. About 33 and a half kilos of my weight go onto the front tire. Um, similar thing with uh, the back tire, although I'm not gonna go through all the calculations, not only because I'm embarrassed that I'm quite heavy, but I've got more experiments that I want to show. So I don't want to stick on this one too much. Um, but if any parts of that were unclear, I know it's kind of a quick run through it. Please let me know. Uh, and just like I do on my show, I try when possible to mention where I get ideas from experiments because often it's from amazing people I've met over the years. So the, uh, this one for the pressure one, I originally learned from Eric Muller at the Exploratorium Teacher Institute in San Francisco. And the year that I learned it from him, he had developed this really awesome um, teacher trainer course for alumni of their teacher institute, summer institute, where we were white water rafting and stopping every, I don't know, every once in a while to do different experiments. So this is one he had adapted for the raft. In the end, the adaptation didn't work all that well. Uh, but still a very good experiment so that like that that one stuck with me um so that's that's the first experiment 
On that theme, I'm going to go through a couple of ones related to pressure. Um, and a couple of these, if you attended my conference at the Scientix webinar in November, a couple of these might seem familiar, but I think there are only like 20 people there and there's more than 200 people signed up for this webinar. So I figure probably 90% of people this will be new for, maybe. Uh, I apologize if I'm wrong uh, with that estimation, but like there's a lot of really fun pressure ones that I want to include and they're kind of quick to go through. Uh, and I love them because I can show up anywhere, like including out, well, outside if there's not much wind. Uh, but including outside of that school, um, and kids always have paper on them. So things with paper, air, and pressure uh, are just wonderful to like to be accessible. So I'm going to take two pieces of paper, hold them parallel. I'm going to blow through them. And before that, I want everyone in the chat to make a prediction whether you think the pages will go apart, whether they'll go together, or whether they'll stay still. And let's take about 30 seconds for anyone, uh, for everyone who's up for it to make a prediction in the chat. And uh, Celia or someone from Scientix, can you let me know when there's been a couple of answers and what the majority seems to say? Yes, of course. Most of uh, the answers uh, from now, they say apart. Excellent. So if you say apart, that's probably because you haven't seen it before. Because <laughs> if, if you'd seen it before, you'd, uh, you'd get it right. So I'm going to uh, blow through the papers. And they stick together. And this is an example of the Bernoulli effect. And the Bernoulli effect says that uh, a moving fluid will, ha well, a fluid that's move a fluid will have lower pressure while it's moving than when it's staying still. So if we think of these two pages, and it's kind of hard to hold them apart with one hand, but when I blow in between, in between air is moving. On the outside, air is not moving. Therefore, the air on the outside that's not moving will have a higher pressure and will push the pages inwards. So let's see that one more time. And I I love that because kids are using paper all the time and so rarely do we think of doing anything uh, things more interesting than writing on the paper. Another variant on that same one that I learned from uh, an American science performer named Paul Taylor back when I was in Mexico is just to hold a single sheet above your lip. This one takes more breath, so I almost never start with this one. Got to first try that time. That's like the first time that's happened. So same thing. The air above is moving. The air below is still. So the air that still has higher pressure than below and it pushes uh, upwards. My favorite take on the same effect, but I often preface it that way um, just to give a context for what's going on. Now I have a bottle of water, and this will work with any cylindrical object. I'm going to take the same piece of paper, put it opposite the bottle from me, and blow hard at the bottle. Huh. I'm going to take half a piece of paper. And repeat that. It may, maybe it's heavier than I expected. Also, this uh, this bottle it's traveled a little bit on my bike, and so it's not perfectly round, but it should still be round enough. So let's give that one more try. <laughs> Fairly inconclusive. So let's get another bottle. One of these days, I'll need to come up with a webinar only of failed experiments and have the challenge for participants to come up with what's going wrong. <gasps> OK, yeah, so I guess it is just that this bottle is in that rough condition, because with this bottle that's newer, that works perfectly. And of course, it appears as if I had blown through the bottle, but actually what's happening is the Bernoulli effect again. So when my breath hits the bottle, because the surface is curved, some will go to one side, some will go to the other. However, 
as the air is traveling along the surface of the bottle, it will have a lower pressure than the still air further out, and it'll be pushed inwards and follow the form of the bottle around. So it'll meet back together on the other side and go straight through. My favorite variant of this uses a balloon. And it uses our good old friend, the drinking straw, which is nearly extinct in Europe. However, there's a couple of strongholds. Notably, Serbia is a good place to go to pick up uh, plastic drinking straws. They still seem to sell them there. Kind of throughout the Balkans, although people in Greece, and there's a lot of people from Greece on this webinar, so you can, you can correct me on the precise version of this. It appears that they have been phased out, like in the rest of the EU. However, there's large stockpiles that people are still selling at markets. So as long as you're not going to like a supermarket, you can still stock up on plastic drinking straws there. And I highly recommend you do if you don't already have a stockpile. I've got something like 1,000 or 2,000 at home because it's so useful for experiments. Oh, and if I forgot to explain, this is just a balloon. That should be obvious. Okay, so balloon, drinking straw, and camera a little bit higher. So we can use the same Bernoulli effect to explain what's going on there. As, uh, as I blow into the straw, the balloon will be pushed up in the stream of air, and normally we might expect it to fall off to the side. However, when it falls to the side, more air is going on the other side. The pressure is lower, so it'll be pulled back to the middle. And you might notice it wobbles back and forth a, a little bit as I do this. And it's even possible to have it fairly out to the side, certainly not horizontal, but at quite an angle because as gravity pulls it down, the more air flows above and the pressure is higher below, it gets pushed upwards. That can be a, a, uh, used to help explain how airplane wings work, although they're fairly controversial how airplane wings work or like giving a con concise explanation. I, I won't bother going into that, but it's one of the things that might contribute to it. Let's see it again. Okay, and there's a couple more experiments I want to make sure I get through. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's go with one more with balloons, because I like balloons. Uh, and one of the reasons I like balloons is because kids always seem to like balloons. Like, if you're somewhere doing experiments, whether it's in your classroom, whether you're brave enough to go somewhere else and do experiments somewhere else, if there's kids involved, no matter how bad your experiment is, if it involves a balloon, you'll have at least half of them absolutely loving what you're doing. Okay, so two balloons and a simple tube. Air can pass through the tube freely. I'm going to inflate one balloon. Okay, so the pink balloon is near its maximum. And the pink balloon is now broken, so hopefully it'll still hold on. Green balloon has significantly less air. Okay, so <laughs> green balloon has less air than the red balloon. And um, there's a lot of questions I could ask, like which has more air? Which did I do more work to put the air in? Or which has more pressure? And the question I'm going to ask you, 
and I want everyone to make a prediction in the chat. When I let go, will air flow from the green balloon to the red balloon, from the red balloon to the green balloon, or not at all? Um, so take 30 seconds or so to make a prediction. And can someone relay from the chat what some of the predictions seem to be? Small to big, equal volumes, red to green. So small to big, mostly. So most, most say small big to big. To... Okay. So most were correct. So now I'm going to do the same thing again. And I'm not going to trick it with a different balloon, but like this one's broken. So we, we could do it with the exact same balloon, but I'm going to get an identical but non-broken pink balloon. Uh, more peach color this time. Okay, and this time. And this part's kind of dangerous because I'm inflating it near its maximum. And to explain the setup, so everyone can make a prediction as I'm just setting it up. Now I have the pink balloon inflated as much as I can. And the green balloon still inflated only a little bit. And I want you to predict now that you saw it go from the smaller green balloon to the big pink balloon. Do we predict the same thing will happen or something different? Will air flow from the pink to the green, from the green to the pink, or not at all. And that's, that's not really fully in the frame, but do we have any predictions? In this case, we have uh, green to pink, and Ivana suggests there is a different air concentration. Ah, and by, by that I might think of pressure. So it went from green to pink before because the green had a lower pressure. Now let's see what happens this time. And I, I don't know if that showed up well on camera. The pink is still bigger than the green, but some of the air went from the pink into the green. And so when the balloon is inflated near its elastic limit, the pressure actually goes up. And I'm gonna take these off and start inflating a balloon and try and explain why. So as I inflate a balloon, anyone who's ever blown up balloons before will have experienced that the first breath is the hardest breath to put into the balloon. The second breath gets easier. The third, not noticeably different from the second, eh, maybe a little bit easier, maybe not. If we think of the material science why, the balloon is made of rubber, rubber can stretch. And it's like a rubber band that can stretch, except the rubber band can only stretch linearly, linearly. And it'll have a constant force that's, well, it'll have a force that's proportional to the extension. Here, the balloon's stretching in two dimensions. It's a two-dimensional surface enclosing a three-dimensional volume. So as I inflate it more, there, the rubber is pulled a little bit thinner than initially. There it gets even thinner than before. And because it's thinner, because it's stretched not only this way, but this way, the force with it, which it's pulling back, the elastic force is getting smaller, and the pressure is actually lower as the balloon inflates more until once the balloon's quite full, it gets harder to put more air in. That's my experience showing that I need to add more pressure to fight against it. An analogous situation is with the elastic band. If you stretch it, you can stretch it normally until you get to one point, it gets kind of harder. And you know that if you keep stretching it, you'll eventually break it. Similarly, if 
if you keep inflating the balloon, it'll eventually pop. So you can actually increase the pressure uh, so it can have more pressure than a less inflated balloon. And that's like an extra twist on this one uh, that I often like to include. Okay, and I think I'll do one or two more experiments uh, and that might be all we have time for. So I want to show one from my friend Takis in Athens, Greece. And Takis, if you're here, say hi in the chat as well. And Takis was at my monthly experiment share last month. He usually comes to them. He's, he's one of the, the big contributors. And there I had the theme of paper and experiments using what you typically find in a student backpack. One of the reasons for that is traveling here, well, traveling anywhere really, I end up in a lot of classrooms where kids at least have what's in their backpack if there's nothing else to experiment with. So it's quite handy to, be, to have a number of ideas for simple experiments. So this one uses a ruler, and I actually just bought this the other day to be able to do this in place I visit. So I still haven't taken it out of the package also, things get like dirty and scratched up biking around, so I've left it in the package for like a week and I've been using it like that, but eventually I'll take the packaging off. But I'm, I'm going to set it up so I have it resting on, uh, on, oh, on an eraser. And actually, seeing how it fits in the frame, I might use my smaller ruler. The, the bigger one, like if I'm doing it in front of a class or several classes together, it's definitely better to have a bigger one so that people can see better, but through the magic of Zoom, you can see small things. So I'm gonna use this as a lever to launch some coins. And these coins, <clears throat> I'm gonna place one at five centimeters from the fulcrum, one at 10. <clears throat> and I want everyone to predict in the chat uh, what you think the ratio of the heights of the coins will be. And I'll give you three options, but if you think it'll be something completely different, write whatever your different guess is. But either, oh, and I'm going to like hit the ruler so it'll fly into the air. Either they might go to the same height. That's one option. Maybe the one that's three times further will go three times higher. Or the one that's three times further maybe will go nine times higher. Or maybe something completely different. So... Write in the chat if you haven't already, and you can just write one, three, or nine um, if writing like a more full prediction is too much work. Do we have any predictions yet? Nine. They say nine. Ah, so nine. Yeah. Th that might be some of the people who were at last month's experiment share, or because uh, Takis is quite active with ACFE centers throughout Greece. Maybe it's a bunch of the Greek participants, or maybe it's a much better known experiment than I knew. Uh, but I, I found it quite impressive. So let's let's see. And that went fast enough that you might not have been able to see it on camera, but certainly it went much higher than the the one that was like than the one that was less distance. And it should be about uh, nine times the difference. I'll, I'll try and do that a bit softer. And that was softer, but the, the one near the end went a lot further still. And the, the explanation, I found like just such a beautiful, simple explanation of it. And it's that as a lever, the one that's further away is going three times the distance. So it'll leave with three times the speed, but kinetic energy is uh, proportional to the speed squared, whereas the height it will go, gravitational potential energy, uh, is uh only proportional to distance I, I don't know why i lost my wording there and so the the distance will be proportional to the square uh of the distance on the lever uh hopefully i didn't mess up the words too much for that explanation and i i think probably for the last experiment because i'll, I'll want to show a couple of slides and invite everyone uh to my experiment shares and to my new video blog for this trip uh, but one more experiment to finish off with. So this one combines both Taki's one, or at least I'll use that for the explanation. Uh, and one that I learned, another one I learned from the people at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. This is my friend Becca, who's a science teacher there. 
And uh, they had this competition called Iron Science Teacher, which was kind of like uh, the old cooking show, Iron Teacher, uh, Iron Chef. That's where they got the name. Uh, and we'd go on stage in front of people at the museum and we'd have a mystery ingredient we'd need to do the experiment with. So Becca's ingredient was air. So I have this uh, bag and it's, it's got a B on it and it says B. I bought it in Bulgaria um, and it was to learn English that they had um, animals in English on the sandwich bags. Okay, so this bag is inflated now. And remember my first experiment where I was saying pressure is force over area. So if I have a big area of the bag, all I need is a little pressure from my bre uh, breath to be able to lift something heavy. So here, and I often do this with books, but I'm not carrying loads of books on my bike. Here's like a, a thing with chargers and cables and like lots of heavy stuff like that. I mean, it's not ridiculously heavy, but it is just kind of to demonstrate that this experiment works. So if I put it on there, as long as I hold the bag firmly closed, with the force of my breath, I can easily lift it into the air, and then it falls off subsequently. Um, and this, if you have a bunch of kids, you can even get them to lift a table with another kid on it. But it takes some coordination. And I realized, probably not for the first time in my life, but I realized the hard way a week ago in Casablanca that it doesn't work with kids younger than about 10 because they just can't blow very hard. I, I don't know what it is like developmentally. If you give them balloons, like they'll be excited to have balloons and younger kids, like they'll, they'll try and then they'll ask an adult, like, can you start it for me? So be careful if there's really young kids. Um, how much you want them to, to inflate. They, they don't have a strong breath. Um, but I'm going to use this same bag now full of air. Well, not full, like half full. And here, put one of the coins I launched for Tacky's ruler experiment. And I'm just going to gently push down with my hands and the coin flies up. And I'm going to push a little bit harder and the coin flies out of the shot in the screen. And if I push harder, you might hear it hit the ceiling where I am. I don't know if that was audible, that it hit the ceiling. It didn't hit it hard, um, but it multiplies the speed at which it's going. And similar to the ruler, but now looking at pressure, here it's decreasing the pressure. It's kind of the, the opposite effect of blowing into the bag, but increasing the speed. Like just with a lever, if you were to look at the, the force at the end of the lever, it's going to be smaller than the force uh, closer in because it's a mechanical disadvantage, but it goes a greater distance. The same thing for this. So the force which is applied to the coin is quite small, but the speed at which it moves is quite big. Um, so it's a little bit of fun with like inflatable bags. Okay, and uh, just because of the time, we'll go back to my slides now because I want to uh, conclude by inviting everyone to join in the fun. I, and I think we're supposed to leave like five to ten minutes for questions, and it might turn into more like five. So can we start sharing my slides again? And while, while waiting to start sharing my slides, they, oh, there, there we go. Uh, so to mention uh, a couple of things, so like I mentioned, for anyone who isn't already aware and already attending, uh, every month I have a monthly experiment share meeting, which is just a simple Zoom session where anyone who wants to show a short experiment uh, is more than welcome to do so. Typically, there's about five to ten of us who might present something over the session, so it lasts usually between an hour, hour and a half. And it's a great place to get new ideas for experiments. M many of the ones I showed today, I picked up from friends uh, through those meetings. Um, I do them in English, but last fall I piloted one in Spanish, which if I didn't get so busy like biking through Morocco, I would have had the second one in Spanish so far. Now I'm planning on having it like early March or so. And following that with a, a pilot in French and eventually in Italian. So if anyone's interested in those, get in touch with me, especially 
if you'd be up for exper sharing experiments in those languages, because the pool of the people who might want to share something is much smaller for languages other than English. Uh, so that's the, the middle part uh, I was mentioning. And I mentioned before, uh, one week from now, it should be the same time. I'm, no, I think it's at seven, I set the time. Go to the link to sign up and you'll see for sure. But I'm, I'm like 90% sure I set the time at seven. Um, but next week, uh, almost same time, same day, Wednesday, if you want to join in on that. Also for this, uh, for this trip, I'm starting a video blog starting on Monday uh, at 7. And I'll be live streaming on YouTube and um, just giving updates, like similar to this webinar, but less focused on teaching because it'll be more for like general people who are interested, including like former students, friends, family, anything like that. Uh, I'll try and include some experiments, but like some some people might be interested in hearing about how it's getting on, trying to bike to then across the Sahara or different schools I go to, things like that. Uh, oh, and of course, for a live stream, it's, it's going to be public on YouTube, so you don't need to sign up for the mailing list. <clears throat> but I made a mailing list because getting internet access might be very unpredictable in some of the places I'll go. Um, but if I'm expecting that, I'll send out an email to the mailing list saying, hey, uh, might not hit a town for the next 200 kilometers. Uh, probably going to delay the the blog until Tuesday or you know, things like that. So like if you if you're interested in all the updates, you can uh, check that out. And then the last thing to mention, uh, if you have any questions or if you want to get in touch with me, either if you're interested in sharing experiments, you have ideas that would help me contact schools, uh, anything like that, then please do be in touch. I'm also on social media. Um, my favorite experiments is like the handle for all that, except Twitter that has a character limit, uh, but I'm not too active on it at the moment. Um, so that's everything for me. Um, thank you for uh, joining and for your interest in what I'm doing. Hopefully you found it interesting. And if you found it interesting, please uh, be in touch or like check out more of what I'm doing. Uh, thanks again. Thank you very much, Michael. It was very interesting as usual to have you uh, in your experiments. We had a question during the, um, uh, the experiments from Elia, and she asked, how can we invite you to our school? Oh, excellent. So it depends, uh, but the easiest is just uh, write to me, get in touch, and I'm usually happy to, to go anywhere. Uh, but to explain a little bit about that, like everything I do is self-funded from savings. So if I'm traveling to your area anyways, that, oh, and usually I don't charge for anything I do. I, may, I could try and work that into a model, but like I like the idea of sharing things for free. Um, but like if I'm not otherwise planning to be in your country or your part of the world, then it can help a lot if you're willing to pay travel expenses to bring me to wherever you're going. Like that's what happened for Kazakhstan and Mexico. And those are prohibitively expensive to get myself to. I mean, not necessarily, but like I'd need to really want to go there. Um, so if you can pay to get me for somewhere, I'll rarely refuse going somewhere. Uh, if you can't, then it'll often be like I'll mention, oh, I'll be in the area at this time with dates around then work because um, I do travel around a lot, but like I, I not everywhere at once either. But like the, the easiest thing is get in touch and we can probably work something out. OK, thank you very much for uh, telling us uh, how to invite you to the school. Um, and please remember to watch also the last episode of uh, Scientix TV because uh, as usual we have uh, um, also there Michael's uh, experiments. Uh, um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, today this webinar. Uh, remember also to sign the signature list. And um, if you have any other question, you can always uh, reach out to us. And um, that's all for today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Michael. Oh, th thank again. you again. And have a, have a good evening, everyone. And have a good evening.